Lead us into truth, we pray. We ask not to see what we have read this evening through the lens of our age, but by the work of the Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would lead us into obedience, that you would help us understand what it means to apply these commands into our daily lives, our particular context and circumstances. Father, we pray your comfort, we pray your instruction as we have need, your help for me now to preach your word clearly and faithfully as I ought. We seek your help together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So our focus of, is verse 22 through to chapter 4, verse 1, where we have reference to bondservants and masters. And I think two questions often come into people's minds when they read this part of the Bible. First, does the Bible condone slavery? That's the first question. Why doesn't Paul preach revolution? The gospel, after all, is all about redemption, freedom, deliverance. So why is Paul calling bondservants to obey their earthly masters? Now, thankfully, none of us are slaves in the sense that we read here. So you might be thinking, well, what relevance does this all have for me? That's the second question. The first century world was evidently very different from our own in all sorts of ways. Is there anything here for the Christian of today to learn from? So my aim is to try and answer both of those questions. Both are important. One, the first one is apologetic, isn't it? Well, does the Bible condone slavery? What do we do when we read passages like this, when others turn to them and go, look at this? The second concerns application. Well, what relevance does this all have for the Christian today? Now, we need to keep two things in mind as we turn to those two questions. The first is verse 17. We need to keep verse 17 in mind. Everything that Paul has to say in our verses this evening is an overflow of what he said there. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What's the message? Make Jesus Lord of your life in all places, in all circumstances, at all times. That's the message. It's a word to believers. We need to bear that in mind. Paul is talking about the the implications of salvation, the, the fruit of faith. Jesus is to be your king. Once you were a rebel, you were a, a condemned sinner, but you've been redeemed in Christ. You've died and you've risen with him. Those verses that we looked at first at the start of chapter 3, you are a new creation and you have a new Lord. You have a new king that you serve. And Jesus is to be Lord of your home. That's the second thing for us to keep in mind. Paul is wanting us to see, well, what does it mean in practice to do these things? And where does he turn first? He says, well, I want you to apply these things in the domestic context, in your home. That's where Christ is to be king. And so he speaks to wives and husbands, children and fathers or parents. We considered those instructions last Sunday evening. Now he turns to slaves and masters. And it's, we need to bear in mind that in, a, in the ancient world, a, a typical household was quite different from the ones that we experience today. Often, three or four generations would live together, and the household would often have slaves. So there'd be the family members and the, the bond servants that are mentioned here. And it's estimated that, about, that potentially up to half of the population at one point in the Roman Empire were slaves potentially 60 million people in the first century. So this church that Paul is writing to would have contained and did contain slaves. And so Paul is addressing them as well as their masters. He's speaking about the home still. That's the context of these commands. That's the context of the day. We need to keep both in mind as we, we seek to answer those two other questions. The first was, well, does the Bible condone slavery? Because these verses confuse a lot of Christians. They're used by opponents to say, well, reject the Bible. Look at verses like this. Surely that's not right in our day and age that, that such things are instructed 
particularly the start of verse 22, bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Again, to give a little bit of background, um, slaves or bond servants in, in that day were, were second-class citizens in every way. In fact, they, they weren't even citizens. They were viewed as possessions, not persons, things rather than fellow humans. And slaves at that time could be of all kinds of ethnic background, black and white. Some were very well educated. Some held great responsibility. So there was a lot of variety in terms of what that looked like in practice in different contexts. But they were still enslaved, dependent, tied to another in some form. And it appears here on first reading that that Paul supports this, that he supports slavery. And modern ears read this with shock, don't they? But actually, the first readers of this letter would have read this with shock. Because actually what Paul is saying in these verses was very revolutionary for its day. And the teaching that he's sowing here sowed the seeds that ultimately undermined this institution. Because Paul doesn't see these people as possessions. He speaks of them and speaks to them as persons. Look back to chapter 3 and verse 11. This is an astounding verse in its day, shocking to the ears of many in the first century world. What does Paul say about Christ's kingdom? Here, there is not Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all. It's very similar, isn't it, to what Bosco was preaching from this morning in Ephesians 2. A revolutionary statement in that day where Paul says there is equality before God regardless of your upbringing, your background, your ethnicity, your status and standing in the world in the eyes of others. You might be a slave in the eyes of men, but you are a son in Jesus, in the sight of God. All these people mentioned need the salvation that Jesus offers. All are made sons of God through faith in Christ. There's no distinctions. There's no hierarchy. Every man and woman has the same sin problem, and every man and woman needs the same savior. And Christ is your new king. You have that unity between you. He is the true master that you follow. That's the the continual message through this chapter. The message to both slave and master. Why were slaves to obey their earthly master? Well, what does he say? Because that's the will of their Lord Jesus. Verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. That's subversive in its day. Paul treats these people not as a thing to be owned, but a child of the living God. He says to them, you actually belong to someone else. You have a heavenly father, a good master who will provide for you eternally, a just master who sees and will act on any injustice you experience. Notice what he says about the master here in verse um, 25, 24 and 25. But even more shocking in the day would be the words that Paul has to say to the masters. Verse 1 of chapter 4. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. He doesn't have much to say to masters, but it's clear, isn't it? The instruction. Remember, you yourself are under authority. You have your own master. Now, this is a message to Christians to Christian households, to Christian believers who had slaves. You serve a just Lord. You have been saved by a gracious God. Imitate your master in your dealings with others. You might be over uh, in authority over others, but you are under authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is 
revolutionary teaching in many respects. A slave is not going to be ill-treated for obeying his master. So for a Christian to go away as a slave and obey Paul's instruction would be, but would be wonderful to many masters. But for a master to go away and to put into practice verse 1 could have caused him big problems because you know, that wouldn't go down well, is it, if, if, if your neighbor next door is treating his slave wonderfully well and, and you're not. Could possibly lead to you know, being ostracized by other masters. This was a whole new idea or concept to many. Not only does the master have rights, he has responsibilities. And we've seen that throughout these these relationships described in the home. There are rights, there are callings, there are responsibilities. It's two-way. And it was this teaching that began to undermine the institution of slavery in the ancient world. Not overnight, not quickly, Slavery was built into the whole sort of economic structure of the ancient world. But as the church grew and the gospel took root, attitudes changed. The gospel transformed thinking. It changed societies. Now, sadly, passages like this have been used in more recent history to justify slavery wrongly. Paul doesn't justify slavery here. He doesn't preach rebellion. What's he doing? He's preaching the implications of Christ's redemption. That's his focus. What difference it should make following Christ in daily life. The gospel should change how you see others. And wherever the gospel is grasped, slavery as an institution cannot stand because the gospel trains us to think differently about one another as we saw this morning. It speaks of a unity that man does not create in Christ. Now, this is not his only word about slavery. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul there instructs slaves to get freedom if they can, so we get a sense also of what he teaches there. And in his short letter to Philemon, he's writing to a Christian slave master, and interestingly, he calls Philemon to treat his slave, Onesimus, as a brother more than a bondservant. So again, he says to that one man, think differently. He's a brother in Christ, first and foremost. That should affect the way you treat him and interact with him and how you use your authority. So Paul isn't supporting the status quo here. He's planting a seed that ultimately transforms society. And as I said last week, this is not Paul's personal opinion after all. It is the word of God. Paul is the messenger. His words are God's words. And this is God's declaration that all believers are slaves of Christ, ultimately. Servants of Christ, regardless of their position in the world. Indeed, if you look on to uh, chapter 4 and verse 7, that's how he describes. He goes on to describe another fellow believer, Tychicus. He describes him as a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. And the word servant here is the same word as bond servant in verse 22. So he's saying to them all, and speaking of this one man, well, we're, we're, you're servants of Christ. You serve him, and that should affect the way you treat others. So that's the answer to the first question in terms of when we read this and then maybe that initial shock that we have or others have. Does the Bible condone slavery? Well, no. The gospel message sowed the seeds of its demise. But there's still that question, isn't it? Well, what relevance does this have for me? For us as Christians today, our second question. We, we speak of slavery, and I, I sort of said, well, none of us are, are slaves here. But the sad reality is that, that slavery does exist in our world, doesn't it? I've preached on this passage before uh, and said, oh, you know, no one here is a slave. And someone came up to me afterwards and said, well, <laughs> slavery still exists. You know, in, my, in my home nation, it's a real issue. You know. And actually, in the last week, the BBC reported that the numbers of people affected by modern slavery has gone up by 10 million in the space of five years. That's people um, who are the victims of sexual trafficking, uh, in forced marriages, or under forced labor around the globe. So it's not simply a past problem. But thankfully, 
I don't think that's been the case for any of us here this evening. None of our families include slaves. None of us are masters in that regard, in the same way as the situation here that Paul is speaking of. So we might understand Paul's reasons for for speaking here to slaves and masters because that was a reality in the church he writes to. But what relevance does it have for you and I where this is not our situation at home or in our church? You might not be a slave, but you are under authority in other places, aren't you? You might be in authority as an employer or an employee. None of us are masters in the sense that Paul speaks of here. The closest equivalent is the workplace, isn't it? Something many of us have experienced or do experience still. A place where we're under authority or we hold authority. A place where Christ is to be king, where he is to be worshipped as a believer in how you live. Where you are called to serve the Lord. And so Paul's words here to us in these few verses contain some principles that help us to live out our faith in the workplace, either as an employer or an employee, or both, perhaps. The gospel is to shape our marriages, our parenting, our workplaces, our attitude to work, whatever form that comes, paid, voluntary, at home, out there, in the office, at the airport, warehouse, wherever it might be. There are three principles I think we can take from these, these verses to help us in our own day as believers to live with Christ as Lord. Here's the first. Firstly, it reminds us that we are made to work, but our work does not define us. We are made to work, but our work does not define us. What's Paul's message to the slave here? The bond servants? You are more than a slave. You are a son. Your identity isn't primarily found in what you do, but who you are in Christ. And that is something that many of us need to hear because we're tempted to find our worth, our value constantly in what we do. And we all too easily make work an idol. That's not to say that what we do in life doesn't matter. It's not wrong to have ambition or desire success in our work, we are made to work. God made us to care and cultivate his creation. We see that in the opening chapters of the Bible. God is a worker, and we are made in his image. We are made to work, creative. We are to harness the gifts he has given us to to, to serve with them in this world. But that work is corrupted by the fall. Our thinking is so often corrupted. We are tempted to make too much or too little of work. On the one hand, we might think, well, work is the problem. It's part of the curse. You know, this is a bad thing that we just have to do because the world's gone wrong. That's how it was viewed in Paul's day. That's why you know, people wanted slaves, because they would do all the work, because work was seen as an evil thing, a wrong thing. Give it to the slave to do. They were inferior because they worked. Now, we tend to go to the other extreme today, I think. Our society makes too much of work and achievement. So having a successful career is the goal of many people's lives, isn't it? I remember at university basically being told, you're here to get skills, to get yourself on the career ladder, to get a good income and work your way up. That's the goal in life was the message at times. Some view jobs are viewed more highly than others. Think of the general attitude we have in society at the moment to to homemakers. Those who stay at the home and are not earning, but raising children. It's seen as a second-rate option by many. A waste of skills and abilities. A second-rate option to pursuing a career. And that, that shouldn't be the case, should it? One of the most important and demanding challenges in life is raising the next generation. You know, that's a one of the most valuable things that we can be doing. Our society has lost a view of that. The gospel is liberating because it says you are far more than what you do. You are not defined by your job title. Your real identity is found, not what you do for a living, but who you are in Jesus. 
You are a child of the king. What does Paul say to us? Look back to verse 12, a wonderful verse of reminder about what the Christian is. In Christ you are chosen, holy, and beloved. Those are the three things that Paul reminds us. In the middle of all of his instructions, he says to the Christian, you are chosen, holy, and beloved. Three words that would be helpful for us to wake up and remember each day as we go out the door and do whatever we do. You are not defined by what other people think of you at work, what your boss thinks of you, or what you do. What society thinks of your occupation. You are chosen, holy, and beloved as a believer. You are made to work, but work does not define you. That was an important message to slaves of that day who were told, well, you're inferior. No, you're not. Not in Christ. You're a child of the king. And it's an important message we still need to hear today. That's the first principle to be applied to our attitude to our work. The second is this. You are called to obey, but your first allegiance is not to your boss. It's to Christ. Look again at verse 22. Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleases, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. In this verse, Paul tells us how to act, and he speaks about our attitude as well. How are we to act at work? Well, obediently to those that we serve. At what times? At all times. When they are present, when they are absent, not just when they're looking on. What attitude are we to have in our work? To be sincere. In other words, serve from the heart. Make your obedience more than lip service, more than grudging duty. Be willing and sincere in all that you, can do, you do. What does that mean in practice? Well, perhaps not moaning behind the boss's back, not engaging in office politics. Now, that can seem like a tough call, can't it? Especially when the demands placed on us seem unreasonable. Or we serve a master or a boss that we don't like, we don't respect, we don't agree with, or is unpleasant. Ultimately, we're being reminded, well, you serve another master. Again, the Christian is being called to submit. This is a theme of Colossians 3, a principle put before us in all of the relationships we've described. Wives submit to husbands, children submit to your father, now slaves and masters, employees and employers. God's will for his people, where we can, whether we like or loathe that we serve, whether we respect them or see them as incompetent, we are to serve them willingly and well. Again, the call to submit, though, is balanced by that call to masters, isn't it? This is a two-way uh, command. Verse 1, chapter 4, Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. They are also under authority. They must use their authority well. They are to lead in such a way that makes obedience easy, understandable, reasonable. One thing to bear in mind again, though, this is a word to believers, isn't it? Bosses who are believers, perhaps for many of you, your boss is not a believer. He's not going to be opening his Bible, reading this passage, giving it thought, and trying to apply it to his daily life. What should you do when you serve such a master who asks you to do something you don't agree with or goes against your conscience, against your beliefs? That's a, those are big issues, aren't they? Practical issues for many Christians today, particularly in our, a climate where, where things are getting harder in some respects for uh, believers to, to work in the workplace. The, the, the big case, I suppose, that we've become familiar with was the Asher's Bakery court case a couple of years ago where they felt they couldn't decorate a cake with a slogan that conflicted with their, their beliefs, their Christian beliefs about marriage. It led to a lengthy court case, um, an investigation as to whether they were discriminating against the customer. Well, that sort of issue could, could come up in all sorts of different walks of life, couldn't it? As a teacher, doctor, all kinds of work environments come with their challenges now. How do you respond? 
We need the wisdom of the Lord, don't we? We need to be in the word. We need to be praying for one another, talking with another, asking about our work, because this is a place where you worship most of the week. Not just what we do here, but what we do out there. But this passage is making something clear to us. Well, your boss is not your ultimate master. You have a higher authority, a higher allegiance to the Lord Jesus. You are to fear God, not man. To seek to please the Lord, not be a people pleaser. The reality is that may come at a cost. It may cost you standing. It may cost you the next rung in the career ladder. It may cost you your job. Jesus is to be the Lord of your work. He is your true boss. Jesus is not to be hung up on the coat rack as you go in. He is to be Lord in all that you do, wherever you are. That's countercultural, isn't it? Because we are, it is fine in our culture to have our beliefs, our faith, as long as we keep it private. But much of what we read here is about living out there in the public. And not just speaking about our faith, but demonstrating it in how we do our work, our attitude towards those we serve. This is not simply a call to put up and shut up at work. You know, we can be thankful, can't we? We live in a society where we do have rights. None of us are slaves in the sense spoken of here. We have opportunity in many of our workplaces to raise concerns legitimately. We can at times look for other jobs if needed. You are made to work, but your work does not define you. We are to be good and faithful workers as far as we are able, but recognize that Christ is the Lord, first and foremost. One more principle I think that we can draw from these verses to help us. Thirdly, you will experience injustice at work, but the Lord will reward you. Whatever you do, verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Why? Well, verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Many of us have worked, and work is not always satisfying or rewarding, is it? And often that comes down to relationships being difficult, not getting on with those that we work with, finding it hard in what we're being asked to do, or the demands put upon us. There will be those times of frustration, disappointment, failure. Perhaps you experience that at the moment. You put, give it your all, you seek to be faithful, it's not recognized. You're overlooked for the promotion. Others get the credit for what you do. Others get paid more than you for doing less, it seems. You feel that sense of injustice. What will keep you going? that your true master sees what you do, even if your earthly boss does not. That's the reassurance of verse 25. God is not blind to the injustices that we experience, and he promises an inheritance. Again, this is revolutionary stuff for Paul's day, because slaves were entitled to nothing. If their master died, well, the inheritance went to the family members, not the slave. And here's Paul saying, well, actually, you have an inheritance that's far better. The Lord sees, and you will receive in Christ. They might not belong to the family, but they belong to the Lord's family. They are God's people. They have the hope of heaven. Many people around us live for retirement, don't they? What I'm going to do when work's finished, what I'm saving up for, the holidays I might have, the activities I might plan. The believer lives for something beyond retirement. He lives for heaven. We have something better and lasting to look forward to. Serve Christ the King, because one day you will be with Christ the King. You are made to work, but it doesn't define you. You are called to obey, but your first allegiance is Christ you will experience frustration, disappointment, injustice in work in some way, but you, see, you serve a Lord who is faithful, just, good, and for whom and through whom there is an inheritance. 
Let's go back to those opening verses of chapter 3 that we've gone back to so many times over the last few Sundays. They're so wonderful for us to contemplate. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's how Paul begins chapter 3, and he ends the chapter by saying, well, this is what it looks like in practice. In everyday life, in the relationships of your home, your work. Make Christ king. Live with him at the front of your minds. Serve him in all things. Why? Because he served you. Jesus is the submissive servant who has laid down his life for you. He is the king, the servant king things we've been reminded of at the start of the letter, the preeminent one, the supreme one, yet the servant who has served you. He asks you to do nothing that he has not already done himself. He is your master, but also your model. But first, he must be your savior. Before you serve Christ you must turn to him in repentance and faith. You have to stop resisting his rule and receive his mercy. And so the question we we have to ask this evening alongside these verses are, are you a member of his household? Are you in Christ? Because Paul is writing to believers here, those who have turned in repentance and faith to Jesus. Are you a rebel or are you a son? Verse 11 of this chapter that we read earlier reminds us that Jesus offers sonship to all who come to him. Again, we had that message this morning. To all who receive him by faith. It doesn't matter where you come from, what position you hold. We all need Christ Jesus, the Savior. Then he becomes your Lord. Then you serve him. I'm sure the sermon this evening and the one last week will raise questions because the commands are sort of blunt and to the point and it's good for us to think through, well, what does this mean in practice in my circumstance? It's good for us to talk together about these things. Perhaps you've got questions you want to ask myself. I'm happy to to sit and listen and to consider. But it's good for us to talk about these things, to be praying for one another because these are the areas of life that we are engaged in the most. More than what we do here on a Sunday evening, what we do Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday, whatever work pattern we have. So let's wrestle, let's pray, let's talk, let's discuss about what we do to put these things into practice. And let's hear the words of verse 17 again before I pray and we share communion. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let me pray. Father God Almighty, we pray your help indeed to do what we are called to do in verse 17. We do confess that, Lord, we fail, that we stand by your grace, we come into your kingdom by your grace, and we grow by your grace. Lord, we ask that you would grant us that help and leading by your spirit to see how these verses must apply to our own situations, which might differ between us. To be godly husbands and wives, parents, children, workers. May your words search us, shape us, Help us, we pray, in doing the things you call us to be and do. We thank you that these are commands for the Christian, that we don't do these things to work our way into your kingdom, but because we belong by the work of Christ at the cross. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.